Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. Every time uh, Scott Morrison uh, has a press conference or one of his uh, ministers, uh, then uh, they urge Australians to, to download the, the COVID-19 Oh, sorry, it's called the COVID Safe app. And uh, they've offered uh, bribes or incentives that uh, if you if you want to get back to the pub or you want to uh, go to the footy, then download the app. Uh, five million Australians uh, so far uh, have downloaded uh, the app. Uh, they've assured us, uh, the, the federal government, that it's not a tracking app and uh, that they've promised uh, heavy criminal penalties uh, for unauthorized uh, use. But should we be satisfied with these explanations and privacy guarantees? Well, the best way to answer that is uh, speaking to my second guest tonight. Uh, James Newbury is an uh, IT expert, uh, also known as uh, the difficult nerd uh, on Twitter. Uh, he is what, uh, in the words of uh, Tony Abbott, would say is a, a tech head, a gamer, and a political uh, junkie. Uh, James, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Tim. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, now, uh, I, when I was, when I mentioned your, your Twitter handle on a previous show, I, I nearly said uh, trusted nerd, which is uh, Jessica Ooh. Yarnieve's uh, Twitter handle. Has anyone else <laughs> made that uh, unfortunate confusion? There has been some unfortunate confusion and um, the less said, the better, I think. <laughs> Let's just move on from such unpleasant topics. <laughs> yep, true. All right, so I've got a, I have a reasonable uh, technological literacy as a, a, a Gen Y or millennial, uh, whatever wh whatever label you want to uh, give to, to, to my uh, generation. So this COVID safe app, it doesn't track your uh, uh, location. It's, it uses Bluetooth to, uh, 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 to basically form these digital handshakes uh, when you, you come into contact with somebody else who's also got the, the app and all the data is stored on your, on your phone. Most people, and this is uh, my basic understanding of Bluetooth, that's how basically you connect your, your smartphone to speakers so you can play your uh, Apple Music or Spotify uh, playlist uh, really loudly. Yeah. Um, so we've done a bit of We've done a bit of um, deconstruction of the app and, and a bit of reverse engineering. Um, one of my late major concerns is that over the past 20 years, we have really ramped up mass surveillance in our country. And, you know, I've lobbied on that pretty hard to the point where I think I might actually be on a fixated persons list. But um, I don't trust, I don't trust where our government is at. Um, around tech very much, you know, we've had so many fails and whatnot. And so people like me with the technical skills and the experience are able to deconstruct these apps and see what they're actually doing. Um, this app monitor, <coughs> excuse me, this app effectively monitors Bluetooth handshakes between your phone and phones around you. Oh, well, it actually monitors them for all Bluetooth devices around you. But um, just like connecting to your speaker when you do that pair thing, there's a handshake. That's happening in the background all the time. Um, and this app keeps track of it. Each phone has in it a hardware identification. And that hardware ID gets logged along with um, an identification for the person. And then those are stored on your phone for 21 days. And if you run into trouble, um, those IDs are matched against real identities and the states in theory can call up those people and say, go get tested for COVID-19. 
so you actually don't need to uh, put put in a personal identifiers into the app. All you need to give uh, is your your phone number. Uh, you don't even have to give your your real name. You can choose a, a pseudonym. So as I've said, you can choose Big Dick Sixty Nine er to be your uh, pseudonym. Uh, your well, money printer goes burr is what I think I'll pick when the time comes. Your postcode uh, and your your age. Uh, range, uh, but uh, uh, as uh, well, you've already informed me uh, that uh, mobile phone numbers uh, in Australia, if you if you want to purchase a SIM card, uh, you have to have a photo ID, uh, even your driver's license number is entered into it. Yeah. Um, so one of the regulations around communications in this country um which will really become a thing during the 5g era when we've all got to upgrade is to whenever you go buy a sim card you must show identification under the acma rules and then um the driving license number for instance is recorded on a form and that is gone and, and put into a database so you can track a, a phone number back to a person that you've identified uh, this is another one of those mass surveillance anti-terror regulations that came in in the early 2000s without real thought. There's no such thing as an anonymous phone number in this country. Uh, because it was back during the, the Abbott uh, government when they proposed and it was uh, passed bipartisanly in the parliament, the, the metadata laws, which... Uh, uh, was sold to us uh, as going to help us uh, catch uh, terrorists and, and child pornographers. But as uh, we've found out since, and this is why we're right to be skeptical about the uh, the, the privacy uh, guarantees, uh, is mm. that lots of not just Commonwealth agencies, but state, even local government agencies, and even some some private financial institutions want access to the, the metadata as well. The metadata legislation is a dog's breakfast. Um, last year, there were about 300,000 metadata requests from some really interesting agencies. One of them um, was the Bankstown City Council chasing a litterer. Another really interesting example was um, a parking authority. But that's not going... We are promised that's not going to happen with this app because... Um, we're getting a whole new bunch of legislation passed, which will make it illegal for any public servant to access this data for anything but health tracking. And that'll be backed up with a five-year prison sentence. That's a lot better than it was last week. The, the government has shifted on this. They're really insisting that we can trust them. But my thing is, is that I want to see the source code. I want every nerd in the country looking at the source code and determining what is in there because my reverse engineering could have missed something or any of us working alone could miss something quite easily. So if the government chooses to release the source code, which in fairness they say they're going to do, we're going to have a really clear understanding of what they're doing. And if they've got nothing to hide, they have nothing to fear from releasing the source code into the public domain. Yeah, that's what they always say to us. Uh, but what is the importance of the the, the source code? Because I, I hear these terms such as open source software, uh, apps. Uh, it, what, it, it, why is it so in, important? Yeah, so um, all computer programs, all apps, every piece of software in the world starts off as a bunch of code. This is called source code. Someone with an appropriate skill can sit down and read the source code and say exactly what the device is going to do. It is simply the instructions that the, the software follows. So right now you and I are talking on Zoom. If we had Zoom's source code, we could see how, source, uh, how Zoom reacts if I press that button or if that event happens or this other event happens. Um, the simple reality is, is that there's no way to hide if the source code is released. It is everything inside that, uh, inside that software, and we will be able to see every line of instruction in it. There is nowhere to hide. So I, I'm a bit cynical about 
the government's surveillance agenda over the past 20 years. Their pattern has been, there's a new threat identified, we rush a law in, then we expand that law to deal with other stuff, and we never get around to reviewing whether or not it was appropriate or whether or not it, it still is fit for purpose. And the, the powers just expand and expand and expand, and it gets really scary where ordinary people find themselves really running afoul of regulations which they were never intended to catch them. So anyway, we can't trust the legislation. It will be salami sliced. So let's have a look at the code itself. Let's see what this software is going to do. And despite that there's uh, 5 million downloads, uh, the app is not yet operational. Uh, state and territory health authorities are still learning how to utilize it themselves. And it's been explained to us that all of the, the digital handshakes, they're stored on our, on our phone. And the, a person who tests uh, positive for coronavirus, uh, who uh, has got this app, they have to consent to their digital handshakes being released. So what does uh, the, 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 the people that uh, this, this infected person has had digital handshakes with, uh, obviously, there is no, the only source of identity of this person is, is, is their mobile number, but mm -hmm. it obviously gets sent to, to everybody with that handshake that this person yeah. has tested positive. Uh, does it give the location of where this handshake occurred? No. Our reverse engineering indicates it doesn't. Now, my concern is that there could be a forced update down the line. However, um, um, a bunch of security nerds like myself have set up a bunch of independent scripts which will compare the, the versions and see what's new in them. So we are keeping an eye on it. Um, but there is no, there are some apparent bugs. It, it looks like from our reverse engineering that the government has taken the original Singaporean code and pulled a lot of stuff out of it. Um, now, there could be some bugs in there that, that are not really a big deal. Um, when you've been in cybersecurity for as long as I have, bugs happen, you kind of get used to them. The, the bigger concern is that um, I want to know that it is systemically impossible for this data to be used in any other way. So, our reverse engineering indicates that there is no location storage, that it is tracking handshakes, the government has said that it's only if you're around for 15 minutes. That's not entirely accurate. It's any Bluetooth handshake that goes on. Um, another concern is that if you live in an apartment building, for instance, and you're in the middle apartment, it will get people through the walls because of the nature of radio communication, just like connecting to that Bluetooth speaker next door or that Wi-Fi network across the road. So it is going to lead to some false positives. It is going to lead to a little bit of concern and panic and I'm really worried that by trying to be clever and get the five million um, downloads in a week and not be transparent where we're really undermining something that could be useful um yeah I don't know it, it's it's a bit like the breadfield scheme in a lot of ways it just keeps we just keep hearing more and more and more about it and it sounds like it's never really been built or thought through completely and um, the local encryption's relatively strong. The, the phone side stuff is really strong. But until we get the source code of what's on the servers, I've still got some concerns. I don't know how they could track the phones from there. They could probably use the metadata database if they wanted to do a location style thing. That would be relatively straightforward. But until we see what's on the other end of it, I'm not convinced. Um, that it's necessarily something to worry about. That's also another reason why we should be skeptical. Uh, go back to, to recent uh, uh, government tech failures here and overseas. Uh, the the mm -hmm. MyGov uh, website uh, crashed. MyGov, census fail. Um, the robo debt, which the High Court has ruled to be completely unlawful. Um, the failures around. The, the privacy breaches around everything 
that has been a central data store and under Stuart Roberts' control that the Minister for Human Services uh, has turned into a bit of a thing. Um, uh, very early on in the job keeper um, period, uh, sorry, the job seeker period, Centrelink had an e explosion of um, income support applications. And Stuart Robert went out to the television cameras and said, we're under a denial of service attack. We are being hacked. And now, to his credit, he came out the next day and said he was wrong. But it doesn't inspire confidence when a minister of the crown doesn't listen to his security nerds when they say, hey, there's a whole lot going on in this network and we never designed it for this much traffic. It's going to be unreliable. Don't panic people. Oh, uh, as I said, I, I have a basic uh, tech understanding, not the uh, the complexities uh, that you have, but I know when, for example, the the unshackled traffic has uh, legitimately spiked, and when we're under DO, uh, DODS attack because our our firewall blocks a whole bunch of IP addresses from Ukraine or or wherever, and. Surely that, that wouldn't take uh, Stuart Robert uh, uh, more than, than five minutes to, to, to check uh, where the source of the traffic spike is. Well, you would hope with a, what the Department of Human Services has a notional budget of $20 billion a year for administration, they would have at least two or three qualified computer nerds in there who could brief him properly. But I'm not going to criticize them. They're doing their best. Now, Scott Morrison said initially that if not enough Australians voluntarily download it, he might make it mandatory. He walked that mm. back there the next day with that guaranteed no way it'd be mandatory, but it was spooky enough that he, he did say that in, an, I think it was an interview with Alan Jones on, yes. on, on 2GB. First of all, the main problem with that is not everyone has smartphones. So you'd have to yeah, make there a are... smartphone uh compulsory and it's not even compulsory to have a form of id on you uh that's why uh back in the 80s the australia card was so venom venomously uh opposed and we know the yeah. smartphone is a hell of a lot more uh of an in it, it, making it mandatory to carry a smartphone is way more of uh, an invasion of privacy and also abuse of of human freedoms than, mm -hmm. than carrying an australia a card but uh, so now they're going with what's known in in public health terms as the nudge approach so yes. want to go to the yeah. footy want to go to the pub quicker uh download uh, yeah the app. yeah and it's like putting on sunscreen to go outside because if you've got the app you can't get sick it's ridiculous um it's probably a useful thing that we're able to track very quickly that for example um say i went to do the grocery shopping and and someone that I didn't know had the Rona, um, it would be handy to say, okay, we need to test you before I go to work, right? It would it would be handy and it would probably help a whole bunch of people. My main concern though is that um, government has shown to me that they don't get it when they compare why we don't trust them with why we don't trust, why we trust Google and Apple. Oh, Google and Apple track a lot more about your life than than we are in this app. Why do you trust them? Well, primarily because they've been really transparent with us all the time. They go to court to stop government overreach and, and then to react to those court cases, we get rushed legislation like the Assistance and Access Act. And I'm not wanting to minimize it, but there are 16.3 million cell phones, in this, uh, smartphones in this country, 16.3 million. Uh, there are roughly 25 million people. We need, therefore, about two-thirds of smartphone owners to have it on their, their, their phone, active at all times. And I don't think it's going to work. Um, but my main concern is that we need to stop this constant nanny state expansion of power. It doesn't help. I... You can opt out of Apple by waiving your credit card. You can opt out of Google by going to DuckDuckGo. You can opt out of a smartphone by spending 30 bucks at Kmart. It is not the same deal when government wants us to download software. You cannot opt out of your government. 
many of us would love to, I'm pretty sure. But it just ain't going to happen. Well, I don't trust the uh, the Alphabet uh, company, uh, which is who owns uh, Google now. But uh, uh, Tim Apple, uh, he's uh, been quite good on on privacy over the years. Uh, you mentioned that uh, 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 the, the Rush legislation over in the US that was uh, because uh, Tim Apple uh, and I call yeah. it, uh, I'm I'm talking about uh, Tim Cook. Uh, but Tim Apple, I, I, yeah, no, I, I know who Tim I, Cook I, is. I, just uh, just for for, for clarity. Uh, but uh, I, do, I do like Trump's nickname for him. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> it's a great nickname. Uh, yeah, t uh, Tim Apple. Uh, he uh, refused uh, an FBI request uh, to unlock the, the San uh, Bernardino uh, shooting terrorists' uh, iPhones, and that's why they rushed through uh, the uh, uh, that piece of legislation. And if and uh, well, even that's a mischaracterization of it. The FBI wanted a master key for all iPhones. Apple went off to the U.S. Circuit Court and got a court order to say, no, that's an overreach. They then told the FBI of a bunch of reputable hacking labs that could, with once someone has physical access to your device, it is simply a matter of time before we break it, right? We're pretty good at breaking into stuff, uh, us hackers. And so... Apple said, you know, here are a bunch of reputable hackers who can help you out, FBI, and in fact, some of them have agreed to do it for free so that we don't pass a ridiculous law and put a ridiculously dangerous piece of software out there because it will leak. Stuxnet is a really great example of a weapon of war generated by government that leaked and turned into some of the most ridiculous malware that we're still cleaning up 20 years later. So you people have shown you can't actually get this done. Go speak to the pros and they'll help you out, but do not pass this terrible precedent. The court agreed with the argument and handed down a, a court order saying, nope, the, the Tim Apple will not be required to produce a master key for all iPhones. And our government immediately, the day of the thing, rushes through on a bipartisan ship uh, on a bipartisan basis, the Access and Assistance Act, which contradicts itself, literally contradicts itself. And um, yeah, it, it, the, this, we all rely on the security services to keep us safe, but they get a little bit trigger happy, don't they? They get a little bit, you know, untransparent and a little bit excitable and tracking the wrong people and people who aren't necessarily real threats. And if you're an ordinary person who just happens to be walking down past someone really nasty, you could get caught up in any of this mass surveillance stuff. and Your life could be destroyed by suspicion just because of a Bluetooth handshake. No, I don't, I don't like that sort of thing. And so um, while the government has shifted from its original no holes barred attitude to something that's approaching reasonable until they release the source code. I'm going to reserve my judgment. I've got a question here on entropy from James Boom. Uh, James, West, are Western nations buying spyware and censoring software from the Chinese to control their, their populations? Um, let's split that up into three categories, the, like into three sub questions. The first question is, are Western nations buying spyware? The answer is yes. Um, are they using it to control their population? I don't know. Um, presumably, you want spyware so that you can spy on stuff. Now, that could be as simple as tracking down um, serious criminals like pedophiles and genuine Islamic terrorists, you know, and, and I don't think anyone objects to the authorities going after those people. Uh, what we object to, I don't think most right thinking people object to, is when it gets across the entire population. So uh, 25 million Australians, we must spy on all of them because a few of them could be bad. That is not appropriate. And the third part of the question is, are we buying this spyware from the Chinese? Not really. Um, the best stuff comes from America and Israel. Uh, the, the best security software comes from Israel because they live under threat. And the best spyware comes from the USA because they have 
genuinely awesome engineers. Um, so I, does that answer that question, do you think, Tim? Yep, I, I, I think so. Uh, now, in it, it, I've mentioned that uh, the, the government has, has gone from the, the, the threat of making it uh, mandatory, despite that yeah. <laughs> being unenforceable now to the nudge uh, mm -hmm. approach. And the nudge approach, yeah. yeah. Do you want to go to the footy? Do you want to mm. eat an ice cream cone? Do you want to, I don't know, rip a cone in your bedroom? Mm. Uh, next global pandemic, pot better be legal is all I'm saying. Uh, uh, I'm not downloading the, the app. You're not. Most of this, I'd say all of this audience is not uh, downloading uh, the app and the it, it, it's also a threat as well that if we don't their their target was forty percent which is around uh, ten million but we we know that and Morrison himself has has talked about uh, getting a, getting the uh, economy into recovery phase getting Australians back to work kids uh, back to school uh, mm -hmm. our you're based in Victoria our premier Daniel Andrews <laughs> I don't think has the same isn't he king Dan yeah sa same goal in in mind yeah yeah uh, um the the nudge argument of you know we can simply download this app and everything can go to normal is bullshit like let's be honest it is utter crap we are going to slowly, the whole point of flattening the curve was so that we would not overwhelm our health system with this virus. Mm. We are going to release, we succeeded well and truly yeah, beyond. We're, we're, it's the, 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 the curve, yeah. despite those, um, well, I guess you'd call them cluster fucks, uh, because <laughs> yes. uh, at the, the CEDAR uh, meets uh, in, in Western uh, Melbourne, and uh, there's obviously uh, uh, that uh, aged care uh, facility in, in Western Sydney, and uh, now that uh, two uh, nursing homes in uh, Melbourne have gone into to lockdown uh, as well, uh, but the curve is still, is still flat. There's not a, a community yeah. uh, spike. Yeah. Uh, but but we there know. is going to be spikes as we go on, right? Mm. We're going to we're going to loosen the restrictions and then clamp down a little more, a little bit. And the idea is that we want to keep the capacity of the health system about where it can handle this. That was the original plan. We locked down so hard, so fast that I think I think it's fair to say that some of the states shut the bed. Um, and and really locked down hard and fast so so aggressively because they were afraid of being blamed for death and destruction. And you can argue whether or not that was appropriate. Um, I'm not convinced the app is the way forward. I think what we're going to see is we're going to release a little bit some more people are going to get sick. We're going to tighten back up. Then we're going to release again and tighten back up. I think that's kind of how this is going to go. And why is it important? Uh, uh, I'm not. I don't know if you have the answer to this question for the authorities to trace uh, a, 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 the the source of every. Uh, infection because they're, they're yeah, talking about Yeah, it's not the so much the source. It's the... Um, okay, so think about this. Um, in an ordinary day, when before the lockdown, right, I would get up, I would have my breakfast, I would go to the train station, I would get on a train for an hour to the city, I would go to the office, and I'd go sit in a, a restaurant meeting um, for my lunch. And then after that, I would go back to another office and have meetings with customers and then I would come home on a different train and come home. In that day I'd interact with on an average day as an ordinary office worker somewhere in the vicinity of what 50 people and those people would all be contacts of mine. If I was carrying the Rona and I didn't know then those 50 people could infect a whole bunch of other people because they don't know to be tested. Um, and so what the theory is, is that if you know that guy you were sitting on the train with for an hour to the city also was exposed to the Rona, you can call him and say, all right, son, you're out of the pool. You're going to sit at home for two weeks until we test you and check you're clear. That's the theory. Um, 
Does it work like that? I don't know. I can tell you that in technical terms, this app is not well planned. It's rushed. Yeah, of course it's rushed. No one begrudges that, I don't think. Um, is it going to help? I don't know. I There is no evidence so far of any of these apps helping. But this is the first time we've rolled out an app globally. Like, I'm talking as humanity. So, is it worth a shot? Probably. But am I prepared to have it on my phone? Not until I see the source code. And it's not that I expect every person in the country to be able to read source code. It's that I expect every person in this country knows someone who knows how to code or can get an opinion and can find out whether or not there's something hidden in there because of the Access and Assistance Act. The Access and Assistance Act says not only can the police, oh sorry, can the police state and the federal authorities compel an employee to put a backdoor into a piece of code, they can compel that employee or that nerd to not tell their employer or else they go to prison. If they discover a backdoor and in any way report it, they can be in trouble. Opening the source code gets us around that act brilliantly because there is nowhere to hide and nerds who did not have any connection with the software will be able to audit it. It is critical that we have open source code. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people uh, forget that last winter uh, uh, we had a, a killer uh, flu season was uh, one of the, the worst in, in recent history. I got a really bad flu, uh, so did my colleagues and associates were all knocked out, knocked out for around about uh, three weeks and I, I even uh, uh, attended uh, the, the county court, uh, one of uh, um, Blair Cottrell's mentions. So I went to the courthouse where there's people going in and leaving. Like, I could, like this, is a, this is the thing. I remember when I got back from that uh, court, court mention, I pretty much collapsed in a heap in the, the office because I was so uh, sick. And But obviously in that would be considered extremely reckless uh, in the in the corona age now well i i've 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 um banned employees from the office before today like years ago when they've had a sniffle um i don't want them spreading their germs um now it's different for computer nerds we can generally do our work anywhere in the world um this lockdown work from home business has really only adjusted the number of days a week I go to the office. Um, but it's not like that for people who work in a factory. It's not like that for people who have to work in the courtroom as a, as a reporter, for instance. Um, even, even the farmer who goes to market in the morning, you know, um, it's very hard to justify it's very hard to justify locking up 25 million people the way we have. I don't, I'm not convinced we have done it with necessarily the right way of thinking or nor have we seemed to do any thought about what this costs us. And I don't mean money. I mean, we know, we absolutely know now because ER doctors are telling us that they have fewer heart attacks than ever coming up. The heart attacks are still happening. People are just not calling ambulances. We know that cancer treatments in Victoria have been delayed. We know that um, surgeries that were considered so urgent they had to be done within four weeks have now been pushed back 18 months. And all of this has a cost in blood. My concern is that we were so fixated on the new threat that we didn't necessarily do any modelling of what our intervention would cost us in blood. No one really cares about the money and the debt, although it's terrifying for our kids and our grandkids. It costs what it costs, right? Um, but what it, what it costs us in human lives, we've looked at one side of the ledger and said, the worst case scenario, if the Rona gets free, we're going to kill 300,000 Australians or whatever it was. Did we compare what our intervention costs in blood? Are we, are we being legitimately proportional to the risk? And um, 
I find I find the lack of thought terrifying. I worry that we locked down 25 million people into house arrest out of social media panic and Peter Van Onselen and their ABC going nuts with no real government must do something, but no real thought as to whether or not it was the right thing. And I don't even mind that the government did something and that we all got thrown in house arrest. I mind that reactionary thing. I want to know that we haven't accidentally had the good outcome. Because if we accidentally have a good outcome, we're not going to know how to deliberately have a good outcome next time. And that terrifies me. The reason why I mentioned uh, last winter's flu season and my own experience with it, because Australia's experience with the coronavirus has 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 not reached those uh, most alarmist and deadly proportions that were uh, predicted that you you just mentioned here we've had only one death of a person under 50 uh, 96 Australians have have died uh, in total we have less than a thousand active cases here and I'm not making a a, a comment on uh, uh, whether the uh, coronavirus itself is uh, as deadly as we've been told, uh, but the the cost benefit of shutting down a lot of the economy last winter flu season it was just business as usual. And you mentioned the the other treatments delayed there. There's been a a lot of it's been lost the the cost benefit uh, analysis of that and the reason and going back to why i mentioned uh contact tracing source of uh transmission if we we didn't do that for i don't know who patient zero was in my circle last winter it it, it that uh, the COVID app seems have we and that's why i've got you on the show the cost benefit of this yeah. app so the theory is is that if you knew in the in the few in the few days before you started to get really sick if you knew that you had the flu if you could be tested for influenza before you got sick would you have gone to the courtroom if i knew i had influenza mm. if you knew for instance you had chickenpox right before you started showing um the rash that chickenpox has would you put yourself near, I don't know, a 10-year-old kid? Probably not. And that's what the contact tracing's for. It's not to find who was before you. It's to find who you potentially have infected so that they can be stopped from infecting others. That's the theory. The messaging around the app is terrible. It is not smart. It's government knows better than the people but i think i think i can tell i think all of your audience would go i'm legitimately sick i legitimately have something really contagious and i'm not going to make other people sick i am going to stay at home for two weeks eating inappropriate snacks and watching netflix i'm, I'm relatively sure that most people if they knew that they were sick because even if they didn't have symptoms they would choose to do the responsible thing and not spread it around and that's what this app is meant to do will it do it i've got no idea um is our government trustworthy not on the surface i want i'm so pleased that we're getting the legislation i now want to see the source code because i'm sick of hearing the what the talk i want to see the action and there's nowhere to hide if i can read your code and yes, I can decompile code and reverse engineer it till the cows come home. But I'm one person and I can make a mistake. If I upload it to Reddit and everybody has an opportunity to look at it and, you know, the <sighs> weaponizing the computer nerd need to correct each other is going to tell you very quickly whether or not there are any backdoors in this software. So we have to have that source code. Uh, uh, going back to uh, uh, my uh, experience with the, the flu last 
winter and obviously the reason I attended that court hearing because uh, there was an important hearing even though it was a mention but uh, I was uh, back Australians have had this this attitude with work that you soldier on like I didn't know that I had the full blown flu you just hope oh I just uh, hopefully I'll get over it in a few days and and I'll be fine which didn't happen I collapsed in a heap after after that after getting back from that uh, hearing and I definitely wouldn't do something like that after this pandemic and I think a lot of Australians who had that uh, soldier on attitude uh, in in the past uh, will reconsider that as well and we'll also see also employers uh, being sort of much more understanding that it's safer for if an employee's got if they're if they if they're feeling quite lightheaded and and sniffly yeah, that it's yeah. best for them to not come into office and this is why we've seen uh, at the same time as we've contained this uh, uh virus 80 percent uh infections of the normal uh flu down already this yeah. year and we've also become i know i uh, have become slack in recent years with uh obviously the <laughs> I know this sounds bad, personal hygiene, uh, but, and, but so have a lot of other people, but we're all sanitizing our hands more, making sure that we do those, those extra hands washing before, say, eating, for example, or after, uh, after a meal, just doing those little bit more things, which we're all picking up our game like we didn't do in the past, which is probably mm. why we had that killer flu season last winter. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that um, the hand washing is really good. Look, you can see it yourself, um, or at least you used to be able to see it yourself when we had things. You'd go to the gents and the number of people that would walk out without washing their hands mm. used to terrify me. I used to tweet about that all the time. Wash your fucking hands, Melbourne. Mm. I, <laughs> um, it's disgusting. Like, mm. it, it, not leaving aside the, the obvious um, health benefits, it's just gross and if we are going to be in a world with new viruses that can kill us regardless of whether or not they've been beaten up the fear is real and the best thing we can do is wash our hands it's simple it's cheap uh, it's easy um, so if we can protect ourselves by ensuring our hands are always clean then that's a wonderful thing and if employers stop assuming the worst of their employees oh you've got a you've got a cold you 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 only had a light sniffle why weren't you at work and that led to that codril soldier on commercial you know oh, yeah that's i want to see that i'm hoping that goes away codril should be banned unless we're using it for other purposes after this pandemic because it it's not okay to be sick and spread it around where there's no cure and um and there is no cure for the uh the the normal influenza yeah like people still get it every every winter yes and if they washed their hands properly and if they felt sick and stayed home fewer people would get it and you know i <sighs> Also, if you go to bed earlier and you take the day off, you apparently recover quicker. Um, I, I'm not a doctor. I am a computer nerd. But just you look at it and you go, if I'm not spreading it around and I'm sick and I'm not out there living my life spreading it around, fewer people are going to get sick. It's just like a computer virus in a lot of ways. If the machine which is infected is pulled off the network quickly, um, then... The other computers aren't going to get sick. Uh, we've got another question from James Boom. Uh, James, is it legal for an employer to pay a contractor to do a digital footprint search to vet employees for hate speech? I'm not sure if that is just a simple social media scouring or something deeper. Um... Okay, so the Cybercrime Act really defines um, what employers can do there. The, the case law around network tracing also would apply there. Uh, effectively, um, if it is on a company-owned piece of equipment, 
then or it uses a company owned network then it's free game they can have all of it if it is a private piece of equipment then it becomes a little more complicated so if you were on a privately held iphone tweeting really quite mean things that's a very different matter than if you were on your desktop machine in the store tweeting the same things and now before we uh, finish up uh, a lot of uh, people uh, in this audience are quite uh, skeptical of, of 5g mobile uh, yeah. technology um, yeah there's been a few sensational videos which are complete fabrication yeah, like which... the, the phone that that rings and that uh wire string around it bursts into flames which has been completely debunked because it's not even a 5g phone it, it actually hasn't been rolled out at all you can't there, there's no hardly any 5g phones for sale in australia unless you want to get a really expensive one no iphone yeah. yet from tim apple is uh, 5g yeah. uh 5g uh compatible uh, mm -hmm. why is it that because obviously there's there's 3g then went up to 4g why is suddenly 5g people seem to think that the increasing they, uh, they believe that 5g will have increasing frequency which will infect our our brains yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, be easier for governments to surveil us and obviously uh, huawei the the chinese firm offering to build 5g networks that's just turbocharged people skepticism yes okay so let's unpack everything you've said there um huawei is a big community as a big company that produces equipment there is question around their trustworthiness this goes back about 20 years as well um Huawei produced a thing called an iron, uh, produced a particular kind of network device, and this particular kind of network device had a software bug in it. I'm not going to bore your audience with all of the technical guts of this. The software bug was identical to a software bug on another vendor's very similar network device, and then they released a patch, which happened to be precisely the same file and precisely the same code that that other vendor used. So I'm not saying they stole the software that ran that device, but if you've got exactly the same bug with exactly the same solution and the solution file that you published to fix the bug came from the other guy, I mean, you know, Huawei also have very deep links to the communist party, um, the man who is the founder of Huawei and, and majority owner of Huawei um, spent a lot of time in, in the Communist Party, oh, sorry, the People's Republic of China's um, Information Warfare Division and has flawless um, connections in that area. So the, the Huawei in the core of our network, they're an unfriendly power I can understand why our authorities are taking a moment of pause and have said, no, you can't have Huawei equipment in the core of the network. We don't really particularly care if a single phone goes down or half a dozen phones go down. We care about that the core network stays up. So I kind of agree with, with uh, ASD's assessment there that, that this is a bad risk. There's some Australian stuff to Signals Directorate. Yes, yes. So the the cyber spy agencies have said look there's a risk here and we need to talk about that before we go too far um i think that's measured and reasonable um 5g itself is um a generation so the g stands for generation yeah. the first generation of cell phone was the big analog brick or the 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 second generation was really your cdma phones you know your motorola StarTech, your little flippy phone um, the third generation was your 3G device from Telstra, your fourth G is your current phone, and the fifth G is simply the next generation of phone. Now, people are a bit confused about this because of people are making money out of that confusion and, and really hyping up the fear around that. Um, it's effectively the same stuff that we use today. It's just faster, and it's faster because it uses 
the old 700, it uses the old frequencies that analog television used to use. I'm not going to bore you, everyone with the mathematics of this, right? Um, but effectively, because of the shape of the radio wave for the old analog signal, you can get a lot more data on there. The downside of it is, is that you will need more base stations because we've all got more devices, we all want more connectivity, we all want more Netflix, we all want HD, 4K, 8K, 16K, which I actually question the point to, but, you know, reality is reality. You all want more data. The only way to get more data is to push more equipment out into the world. Um, and some people are making pretty good coin by selling secrets they don't want you to know, you know, and it's bullshit. Um, the, the lack of trust, the lack of trust we've built up by this slow erosion of our civil liberties, I think is also part of the 5G fear. Mm. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that as well. A, a Getting on to, say, the benefits of, of 5G, how much faster is it? Well, um, so this is like the NBN in, in a way, right? Uh, everyone focuses on the technology between their house and, and the NBN connection, and that's not actually the interesting part of the network. Um, the 5G connection is from your phone to the cellular network, and that's important but it's only the last mile. That's not going to determine how much faster it is. Under absolutely perfect conditions, it's about 25 times faster. You're never going to get that uh, in the real world. You're just not. Um, but the more interesting question is whether or not the server at the other end can sustain the data rate that the network can sustain. And generally, it can't. So you've probably noticed in your home, and your audience has probably noticed this as well, YouTube videos, especially on your smart TV, look a bit washed out lately. And that's because Google decided that everyone was working from home. So we're going to default everything back to 480p rather than like to standard definition rather than high definition. And we're going to do this because most people won't notice, but um, it's going to make global internet networks much easier to deal with while we're all working from home. Um, so I'm not, I'm not convinced that that 5G is really a major threat. I'm I'm for 5G. It is simply another connection type. Um, I'm also not convinced that the horror stories you've read are anything more than clickbait. Uh, like any technology, there's going to be teething problems. Um, just consider cruise control in your car. Now it can actually follow the car in front of you. It couldn't do that in the 80s. So technology gets better. But um, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think that, that the, the, the people who are wanting you to be afraid of 5G are trying to get your attention to make money off you as a general rule. Well, I've appreciated you uh, sharing your technical expertise with myself and uh, my audience uh, to understand uh, the COVID safe app and, and why we are right to be uh, skeptical uh, about it. Um, your comments about um, 5G, uh, we'll see how they're... Tim, uh, let me received. just say one other thing. Let me just say one other thing before we wrap up the show. Yeah. If any of your... Um, any of your viewers are concerned about 5G. As we start to retire 3G stuff, just buy the cheaper stuff. Just buy the 4G. Stay there for a while. It's not going to be compulsory. 5G. It's not going to be compulsory. So, and, and like, you will decide. You will be able to opt in and opt out simply using your credit card. So, use your credit card wisely. Don't buy a 5G phone if you don't want one. Just don't. Um, anyway, I hope you all have found something interesting in what I've had to ramble about. Yes, definitely. And uh, stay safe uh, yourself. Thank you. 
Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.